part of our series, what does it mean to become Christian before next week? And obviously we're then doing our uh, study on it on Sunday next week, uh, 12 o'clock, I'll keep saying it. Um, but in our last sermon, this is the last sermon of this series, and what we're looking at here is the response uh, uh, we should have when the gospel call is heard, when people hear the gospel, what happens? Uh, and, and we might think that either we simply respond by accepting what we have heard or simply reject it. But there's a whole lot going on uh, inside our minds and in our hearts when we hear the gospel. Whether you come to believe it or not, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on, uh, whether it's conviction, whether it's uh, an, an anger towards it, whatever. There's a whole load of things and layers that sit underneath our outward reaction, as it were. But I believe the gospel and the whole of God's word is, is far harder to reject than to uh, accept and believe in it because you have to create another system of belief uh, in order to not believe in God. And it's uh, often said it is hard to believe in God, and it is in another way, but I do think you have to build an entire worldview system in order to not believe the evidence that God exists. And I'm going to show you a video shortly, uh, which kind of goes to that and probably goes to what we talked about last week. How do we evangelize to people? Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that before we have the video. But it isn't because we need something to cling to to feel better about death. Uh, rather that the whole of God's word uh, explains everything uh, we are, everything we do, why we do it, and why we even exist. And even as, even as I say that, I then think about what it really means to become a Christian, uh, especially in what it means to respond to what we are presented with in the Bible. To respond to the gospel and to truly embrace Christianity as your faith takes far more than just knowledge and facts. Uh, we can even say, that it takes more than just accepting Jesus as our saviour. Uh, to respond to the gospel call, all people must sincerely repent of sins and place trust in Jesus for salvation. Uh, but what does that mean? And, and we'll take a look at that. So let, let's break this down. We're going to look at a few things. This is knowledge and acceptance. Look a little bit about dependence and what that means to depend and then we'll look at trust. Uh, but knowledge and acceptance is what we're looking at first. I think it goes with that saying, uh, that in order to know anything, uh, we must hear and read about it. And Romans 10, 14 says this very thing. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without some preaching to them? So it is important that knowledge is gained about the thing we're being asked to trust. Uh, it's not a thing that we can just assume knowledge about God. We have to read about him. We have to learn about who he is, his character. And the Holy Spirit's job is to help us understand the word. Uh, so whilst he doesn't just put words into us, as it were, he helps us to read the Bible, and then we can understand the words uh, that are written on the page. But we know that even with facts, even with truth, people can still deny them, and to the point that the very denial can contradict the very worldview they have uh, and only realise it when they are faced with it. So I'm going to show you a video just to give you a couple of uh, points on what they mean in certain terms they're going to use. It's a very brief video. It's less than a minute. Absolute truth, as you could probably guess, is absolute truth. It is truth that you cannot deny. It is that humans need oxygen to breathe, it is that we need to eat, to live, you know, all those things you cannot deny. They're not uh, subjective. And then there's a relative truth. That is truth that can change every day based on our experience, based on what we feel is true. Uh, and then we, we kind of say, well, that's true because I say it's true. And the term, that's my truth, that's where it comes from. So I'm going to show you a video very quickly. It's an interview, uh, and hopefully it will kind of give you this idea that when we evangelize as well and we speak to these people, this is, this is very gently done in good grace and very gracious towards a person, but only a slight picking of someone's worldview can unravel everything else. So I'm, I'm just going to show you this. Do you believe in absolute truth? No. Okay. Do you believe that all truth is relative person to person? Yeah. Do you believe that mathematics and uh, scientific laws are relative person to person? Yes. 
So for me, if I want to say that 2 plus 2 is 13, that that can be true for me, even though it's not true for you? I think when you get to the fundamental level of 2 plus 2, um, I would. I don't think that is person to person, but when you're getting into theories and formulas that can never be proven, then yes, I believe that you can say different things. So do you think that some things can be proven? Yes. So isn't that absolute truth? back on you see my point uh, straight away it's unraveled uh, even the literally just just picks it and he's still very gracious about it he's not trying to catch her out what he's trying to do is understand what is your worldview how do you look at things and it's simply by just saying hang on a minute you just said this how does that correspond to what you just said earlier and so you see what people do is even with truth they tend to um, even accept the facts that God exists but even that's not enough and so this is what we're dealing with as Christians. This is what we dealt with in a way, and maybe not so direct as what we see today, uh, but certainly we've grappled with truth, we've grappled with the Bible, we've grappled with the worldview, with the reality that we're in today, and said, well, it, does that correspond to what I see? And then we read the Bible and the Holy Spirit helps us and convicts us to understand, and then we're, we're petitioned by God to accept, to see that that is true. James 2 uh, verse 19 says you believe that there is one god good even the demons believe that and shudder so that, that it's not enough that we have belief it's not enough that we just believe in uh, believe that god exists the demons believe in the existence of god but it it does nothing for them in terms of saving them in fact accepting the fact that god exists only then to work against God is the very purpose of the demon's existence. They use that knowledge, as we saw in Romans 1 that people do, but that demons use that knowledge to then try to go against God. And so the same is for us. Romans 1 says that we do that. We know that God exists, but we choose to go against him. We choose to rebel and see our own truth, as it were. But the clue on what is the differential is between, uh, between a saving faith and a simple acceptance of God's existence is born out of the previous verse in James 2, in 18. And it says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith. Uh, I'll show you my faith by what I do. For the demons, uh, knowing God exists never changes them. It doesn't change them. They're always, in that sense, going to be demons. Uh, and their knowledge of God means that they will go and try to, as it were, defeat God even though it's a pointless exercise entirely uh, but it's because they do not trust they do not trust in God for the Christian trusting in that knowledge those facts putting your life in the hands of God is the works that moves us from knowledge to faith so now we don't just have a knowledge of God facts of God we move into trusting God uh, and that's a very important point we'll come on to later so on that basis, not only is it not enough to have knowledge of God, even agreeing with that knowledge and stating that it's true is still not enough. Because people do that all the time. People ex may even accept that what the Bible says is true, but there is a personal decision to make about those facts. There is a personal choice to make about the facts. Someone may say, I believe that God exists. I believe the God of the Bible exists key thing here is that someone put their life in the hands of the one who they say exists or do they just continue to live their life as they always have there's a really good example of this when king agrippa knew and approved of the jewish uh, scriptures or the old testament uh, but when paul stood before him when he was on trial this is what he says acts 26 to 29 the king is familiar with these things and I can speak freely to him I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner uh, King Agrippa do you believe the prophets I know you do then Agrippa said to Paul do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian Paul replied short time or long I pray God that not only you but all who are listening to me today may become what I am 
except for these chains. Do you see what happened? He's got all the knowledge necessary. And this is, this is a great situation because Paul knows what this is about. Paul has been through this situation. He knows all the scriptures, all the Old Testament. He is a scholar in that sense. And what he needed was to move where King Agrippa is to believing in Jesus. He needed to not just know the facts, but understand them and then trust in him. So Paul is a great person to speak to King Agrippa because he knows exactly where he stands. But you see, Agrippa knew and even accepted, but he didn't trust. Even Agrippa knew that he was missing the last step by asking Paul to persuade him. You see, knowledge must be put into action. The knowledge and even acceptance of the knowledge to be true must have such an effect on us that we do something about it. That we want to act on what is true. A couple of quotes from this great guy today, Spurgeon. I think I've used this, but I love this quote. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Again, I can't doubt any of those words. They're so true. We seek knowledge, especially in this age, especially the access we have to knowledge. There is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. So let's look at dependency because Spurgeon's right, obviously, and he says uh, it's not enough to know. It's not enough to have knowledge. It's how we use it, and wisdom plays a part in that. But this word dependency, um, and it's just a very short part of this. I just want to, it just came to me whilst I was writing the sermon. Um, but for Jesus to personally save anyone, that person must decide to depend entirely on and believe in the Son of God, who is God and who is Jesus Christ. But this word dependence or to depend, okay, it was weird, sorry. Did your screen just go off? Good, just checking. <laughs> Uh, but the word dependence has been used against Christians for a long time. And the common way to do this, and this always comes up, uh, is to tell believers that their belief is a crutch. They go, your belief is a crutch. And for some reason, it seems to sting some believers. That, that, that accusation seems to sting. And, and I wonder sometimes, I've heard defenses where it almost people deny that we use Jesus as a crutch. And I, I want to explain what I mean by that. Christians might not like that description of what it means to believe in Jesus, but I would not bother denying it. In fact, I would go even further than that. I would say if it was only just a crutch I needed, wouldn't that be something? I, I don't need a crutch. I need God to carry me. I need God to hold me. I need God to take me through this entire life. A crutch, if only. If only it was just that. I need God to carry me. I need spiritually and literally to put my life in God's hands. And we, what we call that is steering into the skid. When people try and lay these traps and say, oh, it's a crutch. Say, oh, no, no, no. It's more than that. I can't do any of this on my own. None of this, none of anything I do can save me. Because a crutch would imply that I have some part ability to be able to save myself. And literally, I'm only using God just to hop along. Actually, I need God to carry me all the way. Isaiah 46 verse 4 says, Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you all the way. To depend on Jesus is to enter into a relationship with Jesus as the living person and God that he is. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at trust. What does trust mean? What is entering into an actual relationship with the living God look like? 
uh, to put knowledge and acceptance of these facts into action, people must trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life with God. And we can say that trust is belief or faith. It's the same word interchanged. We can use those same words. But the word trust, I believe, has a deeper meaning in today's world. Uh, there's so much that we can so-called believe in. Uh, there's so much we can so-called have faith in. Uh, but for instance, I can believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But I don't need to depend on anything when I believe that fact. It's just a fact that's true, yes, but it, I don't need to depend on anything for it to be true. In the same way, the word faith has come to mean this irrational commitment to something, irrespective of the evidence to the contrary. Uh, as a football fan, as someone who used to go and watch football, um, it's been a hard road supporting Charlton Athletic. Uh, and we stopped doing that because it's such a hard road to support Charlton Athletic. Uh, to see them drop from the Premier League, and we saw them in their height, and they were amazing to watch. Like when they beat the biggest teams, oh my word, it was just great. There were some great moments to see. But then they drop all the way down, and now they're in League One, and kind of the club's in a bit of a mess, and they're worried about what they're going to buy, and land and build flats, and all this kind of stuff going from manager to manager, owner to owner, uh, it just feels hard to support them. But there are diehard fans who support not only this team, but, but every team. Uh, and I've, we've, we've, been, we've sat next to diehard fans, uh, those that will, will absolutely, uh, I, I don't know what, to lose all sense of decorum uh, and just be so determined, even angry at their own supporters for what they might be doing. Uh, I went away one time to Luton. Uh, I think it was Luton Town they played many years ago. Ipswich, thank you, Ipswich Town. Uh, and I went uh, with a friend and it was interesting enough to see people at, ho at the home ground at Cholton, you know, these really diehard fans, away fans of something else. Oh my word, you do not want to say anything different from the away fans of Charlton Athletic, or any, I would say any other team. You need to just be there and do whatever they do in terms of supporting the team. They are diehard. They will do anything, even if the club is falling down the table, performance is poor, they will do it. And, and they have this thing, most fans do, where they kind of go, even if the ev evidence shows that the performance is so bad, they will say, but have faith, they'll turn it around. It's interesting that we're so quick to trust in something other than God, even when that particular thing, the evidence shows, they will not make it out of the relegation zone and they will go down the table into the other one, into the next one and into the next one. I'm not bitter, I promise. I had to stop. We had to stop going, uh, just as a side bit. We had to stop going in the end, partly because of how kind of the vitriol of it all, but also because they dared to charge the same price as if they were in the Premier League, uh, which was just insane. I mean, come on, you know, get over it. Anyway, I'll move on. Back to the point. What's well, that therapy? All right. But trust is uh, much more accurate. When we, when we use the word trust as a Christian, uh, it's much more accurate when it comes to the biblical idea of faith and belief. Trust is a process where the more we know a person, the more we're able to trust them. And John 1 verse 2 and John 3 16 says this, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the key phrases there uh, must be... Uh, are believed in and believe in. The person who believes in Jesus is not the same as a person who believes Jesus. Does that make sense? Uh, many people believed what Jesus said. Many, many more people rejected to believe in Jesus. They, they did not go as far as to believe in what he said, and so follow him and lay their life down 
for him, as it were, for the faith. So many people left him towards the end. Many people betrayed Jesus, even his disciples uh, who claimed, even Peter, who claimed he would stay with him no matter what. Uh, and gracious Jesus, knowing Peter would do that, knowing Peter would give in and submit and say, I can't do this. I don't want to be known as a, as a follower in case I get killed. Uh, this is all of us. This is what we do. But Jesus graciously knew all this uh, and was teaching Peter uh, something very important. But it's not the same. You have to believe in Jesus, not just believe him. One is to act by belief in that knowledge, and the other is to simply believe facts about Jesus. Uh, Leon Morris uh, has a quote here. Faith for John is an activity which takes men right out of themselves and makes them one with Christ. It is intensely personal to trust in Jesus. I think this is where we need to change our understanding of the relationship Jesus invites us into. Take any relationship you have had where you've trusted a person so much that you feel safe with them. That whatever you tell them, you know you can trust them to not condemn you, but to be a good and trustworthy friend who will bring understanding. Hard to find in this world. But now what if that relationship was compromised? That the person you trusted now told everyone everything you ever told them, that would be a betrayal. With Jesus, we are told to have that same level of trust in him. Uh, we can only trust in as much as we can trust as human beings. But in the same way, we might have the closest of friends, the closest of people with us. We still want to trust uh, secret things, things that we need help with to them. But we are fallible. And as human beings, we're not always good at friendships, even if they are best friends, best trustworthy friends. Jesus wants us to have that same level of trust in him uh, we have with our most closest friend. In other words, to trust Jesus as a living person, just as we would with our closest friend. The difference in how that trust is rewarded, though, is completely removed from how it's rewarded by a person, a normal human person, as it were. It is that we have a God who will never betray us. We have a God who will never go back on his word. We have a God who will always deliver now and in the future. We have a God whose yes is yes and no is no. Acts 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. We may be able to learn how to trust people, but ultimately that will come and go over our lifetimes in our experience. But Jesus is the only way by which we can be saved and our dependency, our trust in him will never be betrayed. And so for a person to trust in Jesus, three things must be present. Knowledge or understanding of the facts, agreement with those facts, and trust in Jesus for that salvation as the only way to God. Those are the three things that any Christian must have. That's not my opinion. I believe it's absolutely biblical. Uh, we put our life in the hands of Jesus. It is the fundamental last step in becoming a Christian to trust Jesus with your life. It's especially important that everyone who comes to Jesus for their salvation must admit that we are all sinners. It is absolutely paramount that we are honest and open with a God who already tells us who we are. Do I admit to what God has told me, the person who I am? Do I admit to that charge? Do I admit to that statement? We must admit we're all sinners. And then that Christ paid the penalty for our sin. That is where we might say that someone moves from fact to trust. It's not just a bunch of facts. It's not just a bunch of knowledge. Now I trust from what I know. And the very admission of this fact is in itself acting on the knowledge. 
And so thereby understanding, agreeing and trusting in Jesus. It's really, I find it really interesting to take apart this process because we can always just look at the surface and go, someone agrees and becomes a, a Christian and someone doesn't want to. But actually there is a whole lot going on underneath, especially when it comes to the way God is working in us. And so this is why it is crucial that trust in Jesus and repentance of sin must come together. Repentance is something that occurs in the heart. It's something personal to each and every believer, each and every person. It must occur in the heart of the individual. It is an intellectual understanding, but it's also an emotional response. Uh, by, use it by, by sorrow, we, we, we cry, we have sorrow over the sin that we have learned that we have, that we've committed against God. And so we have sorrow for sin, and then it turns to hatred of sin. We don't want to do that anymore. And then there's a personal choice made by a person to turn from sin and renouncing it entirely. Romans 2 verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Through God showing his kindness, so to lead us to repentance, we recognise that kindness by taking up the offer to repent. And so we're encouraged. Acts 3 verse 19. Repent then. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I think this is, I've got an ESV version. Repent, therefore, turn back. Your sins may be blotted out. Now, does that mean that Christians stop sinning from that moment? Does that mean that when we trust God, trust in Jesus, that all of a sudden we stop sinning because we hate sin. No, it doesn't mean we stop. Here's the, here's the, the big difference. I'm not saying we obviously continue in the same amount of sin, but we're now aware of this very, what is invisible to us now, a very visible battle of the heart and mind, the spiritual battle that now we have to engage with. And at times, we will not win that battle. At times, individual battles we may lose and so therefore fall to sin. It would be silly of me to say that to come to Jesus, it just won't happen again. We are in a world, an environment, in these human bodies, these broken bodies that will suffer and fall to sin at times. But our perspective changes. This is what changes. So everything we do and how we live is now done through the lens of that changed and changing heart. So if you can think about when you thought it was okay to sin, people often who are not Christian deny that they're sinning. They're just doing what they want to do. It's their free choice, their free will to want to sin or want to do what they want, but not recognize it as sin. We now recognize the things in our lives that are sinful. So when sin does occur, the same response should happen again and again. For when we do sin, we should grieve because it offends a holy God. Before that wouldn't have mattered to me. It wouldn't have made any difference to me. But now it does when I think that that's, that's sinful and that I'm... Yeah, you go for all the things of guilt, of feeling not worthy, of feeling all of those things that we do as human beings. But God knows us inside out. He absolutely knows every single part of us. He is not surprised by our sin. That's why he had to send his son. He knew we needed a remedy. He knows we still need that remedy. Even as Christians, we still need to trust in Jesus every day. We still need to come back and say, Lord, forgive me. I know that would have pained you for me to do that, but thank you for your son who has covered me in his blood, who has died for my sin, and I give that to you, Lord, and I repent. Please forgive me. 
2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. That's, that's exactly, I can tell you that as experiencing something, I, that, I think that is exactly sums it up. If I'm a Christian, I, I, I know what godly sorrow is. I know what it is. I'm not God, but I know what godly sorrow is because God has sorrow over sin. And now my perspective is that it's from, certainly from God's point of view, I, I'm sorrowful over what I've done. But it brings repentance, and repentance leads to salvation. Even sorrow, even sorrow in itself is not sufficient. Unless we understand that our sin and wrongdoing causes offence to God, and so want to commit to forsake that sin. You see what's happened again. It's an action. It's something that we act on. It's knowing that that's offensive to God, and then we act on it, and we say, Lord, forgive me. With a genuine heart, Lord, please forgive me for the sin I've committed against you. That sorrow is a godly sorrow. That pain that you feel when it happens, that's a godly sorrow. And so this is why it's important that both trust in Jesus and repentance must happen together. One without the other simply does not complete the circle. When we turn to Jesus for salvation, rescue from our sins, we're turning away from sins and we're asking Jesus to save us from it. That's doing it all in one action. That's one thing that we do. We turn away from sin and then we're in the middle place and then we turn to Jesus because we can't save ourselves and he saves us. Unfortunately, there are many people who get this all confused and they think they can just be good people and then they're left in the middle. I won't do bad things. The problem is there's nothing still to save them except they're trying to do it themselves. But for the Christian, for the one who responds to the message, it is a turning away to turn to Jesus and say, I want to be saved from this. And so we cannot simply be sorry for our sin, but recognize that Jesus is the only way to be saved from our sin, to wipe out the debt that sin has created. So when we turn to him who is not of this world, we turn away from this world and all its sin to the one who can redeem us from it. Matthew eleven twenty-eight to 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest from your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. While we get relief and rest from the sin we've carried, we must also be willing to submit and be obedient to Jesus' direction and to learn from him. Again, this is what has to happen together. I hold my sin and I give it to Jesus. And I say, I don't want to do that anymore. And I give that to him. He's the one who takes it. But that's not the end. It's just the beginning. Now Jesus is going to teach me continuously how to move away from this other life I used to have. But I must be willing not only to give my sin to him, but to learn. How can I be more like Christ? I must listen to Jesus. I must read the word. I must engage with the Holy Spirit. Luke 9, 23 to 24 says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I'm missing a verse. 24. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. You see, our response to the gospel call is not simply a one-off action that clears the deck, sorts everything out. No amount of penance, no ten Hail Marys will remove the sin we have committed. For that only really encourages us to treat sin like lines on a chalkboard. When we run out of room, just wipe it down and start again. 
Trust in Jesus and true repentance of sin is an attitude of the heart that will be living, we will be living throughout our Christian lives. Galatians 2.20, uh, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, that I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the gospel call. To not only hear it, understand it and acknowledge it, but that we trust in the one who gave it to us. Not only at the point of conversion, but each and every day until we meet him in the air. And I think the best way to sum this up must go to the king of quotes, uh, Spurgeon. My evidence that I'm saved does not line the fact that I preach or that I do this or that. All my hope lies in this, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. I'm a sinner, I trust him, then he came to save me and I'm saved. You see, what I've done here is that this is, this is Spurgeon just basically closing it all up and saying, this is what it means. All I've done today is tell you what's in the process of that. What happens uh, when we trust in Jesus? What happens when we hear the call of God on our lives? But Spurgeon says here, but once you trust him, trust him, not just hear about him, but you trust him, you will be saved. Let's pray and then we'll worship together.